here we are again appreciating and uh, having fun and wow we even heard from somebody that I used to know in my days which weren't that very long ago of pal talk yeah uh, well I, I was a chat room denizen for many 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 years uh, especially in the days of the old Yahoo chat uh, I'd spend vast incredible amounts of time uh, just chatting away uh, especially once voice chat became a prevalent thing uh, talking DJing, um, playing segments of things, just overall uh, being uh, a nuisance and, uh, and an entertainer of some sort, or at least believing I was. And uh, I had to give it up, uh, I don't know, about eight months ago, ten months ago. Um, I just reached, well, the number one, like everywhere else, chat had become polarized into the uh, political sides the right and the left and uh, the, the, the general discourse had become so limited and you know if you weren't in accord with uh, another person's political views it didn't matter that you liked the same music pretty much had the same tastes in movies or anything else. Uh, you were, uh, well, uh, as I've said before, uh, nobody really knows what the word fascist means aside from uh, the, somebody who disagrees with me politically. And I don't know. Uh, it reached a certain point of just, it was no longer a pleasure. It was no longer something that was enhancing my life. I was just getting cranky and angry and feeling misunderstood. And of course I know what I'm talking about and you don't. Uh, that attitude which prevails in our culture in general. And I, I, I'm, I'm escaping that. Uh, that's uh, part of what this show's all about. But one of my old uh, chat uh, friends found the appreciator and uh, expressed a little appreciation and was glad to hear I was okay and moving along. And uh, if you are continuing to listen, I do appreciate that. And uh, you can tell all our, uh, if you if you still chat, you can tell all our uh, all my denizen buddies where they can, well, not my enemies. <laughs> That's just what I need. Uh, nasty comments. Oh, my feelings will be so hurt. But, you know, it, it, what it does, it, it ups my listenership, so I can't complain about that. Oh, boy. And uh, what we're going to do today, for starters anyways, is, uh, as I've mentioned, I have sort of started to study with my liminary friends philosophy and uh, one of the things I have been reading lately it the old stuff the old ancient Roman stuff uh, Marcus Aurelius who was an emperor of Rome and a philosopher and politician uh, his meditations and this is from uh, book two uh, written among the Quadi on the River Gran. And I'm just going to read you uh, a, a, a paragraph that I think is very uh, pertinent to everything. Um, let's see. And, and this is, I suppose, a meditation for uh, all of us. Say to yourself first thing in the morning, Today, I shall meet people who are meddling, ungrateful, aggressive, treacherous, malicious, unsocial. All this has afflicted them through their ignorance of true good and evil. But I have seen that the nature of good is what is right, and the nature of evil what is wrong, and I have reflected that the nature of the offender himself is akin to my own, not a kinship of blood or seed, but a sharing in the same mind, the same fragment of divinity. Therefore I cannot be harmed by any of them, as none will infect me with their wrong, nor can I be angry with my kinsmen or hate him. We were born for cooperation like feet, like hands, like eyelids, like the rows of upper and lower teeth. So to work in opposition to one against another is against nature, and anger or rejection is opposition. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. He does... Well, this was the days of the Roman gods, so that's a little different than our current uh, socio-religious construct. I mean, if there were gods of the laptop and a god of the mouse and a god of the internet, um, I don't know. I might have little uh, deities of them and... Uh, pay them respect of some sort. Maybe I'm joking, maybe I'm not. It's hard to tell. I even, I'm not sure, but it seemed like a clever thing to say at the moment. So, so I did. And I've also, at some point, I want to read you a little of Nietzsche. I am also in bits reading a piece of his, it's a shorter book, on the advantage and disadvantage of history for life. And uh, the basic premise of the book is knowing history is one thing, but falling into it, getting too involved in the personalities and the details, blurs the actual significance somehow. And it's an interesting thought. There's a lot more to Nietzsche than, you know, a couple of catchphrases like, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and such. Um, yeah, that, that, and that's our philosophy corner. Um, another thing, well, I have an interesting appreciation for uh, somebody I've worked for and with, uh, done voiceovers for, uh, Peter Bernard, who uh, has the Scary Stories NYC channel on YouTube. And as a friend, I appreciate him because, you know, we've gone through some trials and tribulations, but uh, we're still friendly, and from time to time, I still voice a dog band story for him. And I've got to admire and appreciate his stick to itiveness. He does not give up. He writes so many stories, uh, a story a day easily, if not more, uh, about, uh, well, he's into cryptids, and he's into uh, Bigfoot. Uh, Dogman specifically, because I guess that's his specialty. And uh, the stories are... It's fascinating, really, uh, that uh, there... And there very well could be uh, this hybrid. It's I guess it's kind of like a werewolf or a wolfman, but doggier. Uh, I, I don't quite understand the difference, although I guess dogmen aren't, uh, there's not the whole mythology with the full moon and the wolfsbane and all that. And they seem to have no known weakness. They're just big, giant, dog-headed, human-like creatures who uh, tend to scare people. And I'm not sure if we ever find out what happens when a dogman catches a human. That would be kind of interesting. I mean, would they eat them? Uh, are they just trying to scare us away from their habitats? I don't know. Um, but, uh, hey, if, if that kind of interests you and you've never listened to Peter Bernard, check him out and maybe once in a while you'll hear my dulcet tones intoning one of his uh, writings right there on the channel. And uh, another thing I appreciate is another thing the liminaries got me started on, drinking just cool, clear water. I mean, almost everything else, whether it has sugar, whether it's juice, whether it has oh, the corn syrup, just stay away from that stuff. But it doesn't quench the thirst. And uh, as far as, you know, I, I suppose we need hydration. And I think that stuff... All these other things don't directly, like, it's better to just drink the water. I mean, yeah, the, the Perrier is nice, you can do that. Uh, or a little seltzer water, what are they, the two cents plain, as they used to call uh, seltzer, which all seltzer is, is, you know, soda without the syrup. It's the bubble water, uh, and it, it it's good. And I don't know, I still, that the, the whole sugar thing, is really puzzling because I, I crave it like an addict. If I don't have something sweet, I can get like really. And I know I have some hypoglycemia, but I think it's more complicated than that.
and the levels on this are frightfully low. I hope uh, the wonders of uh, Audacity. Audacity is the program that uh, I use to uh, produce most, if not all, of my audio and talk about appreciation. Uh, it really is a wonderful uh, app, and it's totally free. It doesn't cost anything. And, I mean, how can you go wrong with an app that's free? It, it's beautiful. We, we all love Audacity. Although, I mean, hey, I would use... I don't know. I have tried Pro Tools, and I've reached a point where if I have a software that works, I don't want to learn how a new software works and where all the gigaws are. And, I mean, even when Audacity updates, I mean, this last uh, update, the new versions are so different in certain ways. Um, it's kind of tricky. But uh, I'm finally getting to the point where I'm comfortable with it. Um, what can I tell you? I was talking about professional wrestling the other day, and we lost one of the all-time greats. Um, back in the day, uh, well, growing up, I mean, almost always Bruno San Martino was the wrestling champion in where I grew up outside of New York City, um, the, the World Wide Wrestling Federation, later the World Wrestling Federation, now WWE World Wrestling Entertainment, the McMahon family. Uh, Bruno San Martino was the perennial champion and uh, was until, uh, well, first he uh, gave up the title for a while due to an injury. Then he came back, and then he lost the title to a man by the name of Superstar Billy Graham, who was really the prototype for all, lots of these modern uh, wrestlers, at least the ones that made it big in the 80s. I mean, um, Hulk Hogan is certainly at least partially a uh, clone of uh, Superstar Billy Graham, and... Uh, uh, Jesse the Body Ventura, probably better known for his uh, conspiracy theories and his politics, was, uh, I don't think he was ever champion, but uh, he was a popular wrestler and a commentator for many years for WWE. But superstar Billy Graham, uh, in some of my prime years, was a very popular champion. And... Um, he passed on in the last uh, month or so, and I don't know, just all of these heroes of mine uh, dying. Oh, man. It's just, but this is what happens. I mean, I realize that I am 63, and the people I looked up to growing up are older than me. I mean, Paul McCartney's 80 years old now or something? Mick Jagger? It's to think about that is really strange. I mean, John Lydon is fairly close to my age, but even he's probably pushing close to 70 now. Um, just totally weird. And uh, I, I don't know what to say about that at all. Um, oh, and uh, I the other day, we looked at Neil Young's debut album. And uh, I don't know, like I say, that I'm going to do all of the Neil Young albums, but uh, I have a review here, song by song, of his second album, uh, which was entitled Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere. And this is from 1969, and by this point, it was certain that there was no more Buffalo Springfield, which was the band that pretty much brought him into the public eye. Uh, but this is also the album where the band that became Crazy Horse was formed. Uh, and this is a Neil Young with Crazy Horse album. And uh, there's some uh, great... Well, it starts off with one of his best-known songs, Cinnamon Girl, which uh, on the star rating, I give four stars. Um, it, it still sounds good. It's a classic tune. And that fuzz guitar sound is just so nice. It's crisp. 
it's clean. I'm gonna find me a cinnamon girl. And uh, because of Marshall Crenshaw's cynical girl, I, I have this tendency to think cynical girl, but Neil's girl is a cinnamon girl. And uh, this is one of three songs on the album, two of which have become standards. Um, that was recorded when he was very sick with 103 Fahrenheit, that's a 39.5 Celsius fever, which, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, being sick uh, helps sometimes. Uh, the second song on the album, another four-star song. This song opens up Bang Bang, and uh, the, it's a, a country Neil song. Um, Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere, the title track, very amiable, and it has some really neat vocal layers. It's very warm and poppy, and uh, very economical, but uh, still very fine guitar playing on that. And uh, next, the worst song on the album, in my humble opinion, of course, Round and Round, parenthetically, It Won't Be Long. And uh, this one, it's... It has that whiny Neil Young feel that gets to me. I mean, this, his voice, it, it, it always kind of runs on the edge of whiny, but uh, this, the, the whininess on this one, um, it, it maybe the first out of the two albums that really strikes me as that whiny Neil Young. I mean, it is pretty in its way and tender, but the harmonies aren't working for me. And uh, I, I admire that he went here with the sappiness, and uh, it's long. Even though the title says it won't be long, ironically, it's almost six minutes long. And yeah, I, again, it's not terrible. Two and a half stars is a little better than average, but it, it is the lowest ranked song on this album. Uh, and then the easy to play. Back in the 70s, this was the one uh, guitar beginners would play, Down by the River, and it's kind of classic. Uh, three and three quarter stars for this one. Um, the bass is so simple and solid. Uh, the rhythm section on the whole album up to this point is just aces, holding down the bottom without being too showy, uh, and it's got some nice dangerous sounding lead lines. And uh, Danny Witten, uh, who uh, I later on the song Needle in the Damage Time was written about. Just plays a nice counter electric guitar to Neil's. And uh, the, the quote from the album uh, lyric uh, She could drag me over the rainbow kind of resonates with me. I, I like that. Uh, the guitars are cooking and laid back at the same time on this one. Um, only three more songs on the album. Yeah, that's kind of a short album. Uh, the Losing End, parenthetically, When You're On, When You're On The Losing End. This one gets two and three quarters. Uh, the second worst song on the album. It's just uh, fun and lopey country western with a little psychedelic gleam to it. Um, it. It has a feeling that this song, out of all of them, was just kind of tossed off without too much thought. It's flawed, but the vocal works, and, uh, you know, it's pleasant enough. Um, then, another four-star song, Running Dry, parenthetically, Requiem for the Rockets. And, yeah, a lot of, uh, it's, it's like a parenthesis title bonanza with three songs on this album. Uh, and, uh, let's see, it's, it's got a little fiddle, some ballady folk feel, and it's really nicely arranged. There's some tasty background vocals. And uh, it, it's a song of regret. It, it's warm. And the band is very nicely restrained. And definitely right there and in it. And uh, the last song on the album, three and a half stars to it for Cowgirl in the Sand. It's a much more rocky song. That fuzz tone is back. And it's got a two chord vamp that works. I mean, it really is for me. It gives me great pleasure to listen to these uh, two guitarists, Danny Witten and Neil Young, play together. Um, and I don't know. Uh, are they going to that well a little too much? A little too much jam? I can't say. 
And uh, the m lyric may not be woke. Uh, d d d here's a quote. Woman in you makes you play this game. Uh, yeah. Women playing games. Oh, boy. Poor Neil. Uh, but, yeah, three and a half stars for that. And uh, overall, this album averages three and a half stars, which uh, actually makes it better than the 2.8 stars that the debut album averages. And uh, the cover itself is kind of neat. Uh, it's a point Eliza photograph, a shot of him in flannel, leaning against a tree with a dog, some canyons and mountains behind, and uh, allegedly uh, that they, the credit is given to a man by the name of Frank Bez for the cover photo. And uh, as a mostly uh, retro, old-time comic book fan, uh, I belong to at least one Facebook group or page that does that sort of thing, but I get them all mixed up. Um, I'm into the silver and golden age, maybe a little bronze age, and some of the more edgy stuff, but uh, the last reading I was doing was pure golden age, and maybe we'll talk more in depth about that. But uh, what's interesting is uh, I, you, you all of a sudden get these badges, top fan, most informative. Um, I don't know. It, it, uh, I kind of... That, that jazzes me. I appreciate the being recognized and I get some... I guess it's like the blue check people on Twitter. It gives you some sort of comic book street cred to have a badge. Oh man, pull over here. I'll show you my badge. You're not uh, reading that Batman comic correctly. It's kind of weird. Um, pages and badges. And uh, I, I do want to express my appreciation. I've mentioned before that I belong to a uh, baseball sim league. Uh, it's a, it, I don't know. It, it seems to have uh, lost some momentum. But uh, the social aspect is great, and I really, really appreciate and I really, really appreciate the people uh, there. I mean, it's for me, it's more fun. I guess it's taken the place of the aforementioned chat rooms. Um, and it, it doesn't really but we haven't gotten into any politics there, which is really nice. We just talk about a little bit about pop culture, but uh, mostly about baseball. And because it's old baseball, I can participate because, I don't know, I haven't paid very much attention since the early 80s to uh, the whys and wherefores of modern baseball. But uh, that old stuff, I mean, it's, it's old memories that it brings back. I mean, I was really, really into baseball as a kid. I mean, I played, I collected the cards. I was, remember flipping baseball cards? I, I was always terrible at it and lose all my cards, but that didn't stop me from getting more cards and losing those. And, um, yeah, that, 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 that guy, Beatles Eternally, uh, his channel is the one that I am most often found on. And there's also what Legend Sports Universe, among others, and it's just a bunch of guys uh, babbling away, which is, I don't know, that manly bonding stuff. And uh, th th there's a phenomenon that I'm kind of uh, fascinated by on YouTube now. Um, and I think they got the idea from Reddit, uh, people doing quote-unquote icebergs on uh, different topics. And what an iceberg is in this context is um, trivial stuff and obscure stuff about popular topics. And of course, under the, the iceberg theory is what you see is just a little tiny bit of what's really there. And the deeper you get into the iceberg, the more um, obscure the facts are. And uh, let's, let, let's look at some of the uh, 
icebergs that you might check out. And uh, my search, uh, let's just read down. Uh, let's see. The Tumblr Controversy Iceberg. And that's an hour of different things about the Tumblr site, which I'm not even that familiar with. It's another bizarro Reddit-like uh, social media type of thing. Unexplained Incidents. Yeah, this is more of my... The, it's, that one's an hour long. The Ultimate Obscure Theories Iceberg Explained. That's almost two hours long. Uh, video Game Hoaxes and Rumors Iceberg. Paleontology Fringe Theories. Uh, you think the cryptids that people think live today are wild? Paleontology Fringe Theories are even more uh, nuts. And as you go down it, they do them in different tiers. And uh, by the time you get to the fifth tier, it's such obscure, crazy stuff in a lot of these. And yes, some are better than others. But I don't know, as a trivia nut, these really uh, get my, uh, my stove cooking. Let's see, Weird Canada Iceberg. Uh, ultimate Iceberg of... Un yeah, it's mostly... Um, what do you call it, um, like paranormal stuff, uh, just flying saucers and Bigfoots and uh, the disturbing CIA iceberg, the Mandela Effect iceberg, the alternate reality games ARG iceberg, and uh, lost media icebergs, extensive and otherwise. Um, the Creepy Strange YouTube Video Iceberg. Banned Cartoons and Animations Iceberg. I mean, these are a lot of topics that I could be really into. And, and, and the appreciator, well, yeah, he's kind of a dabbler as well. And uh, I dabble in all, court, uh, all sorts of interesting things. Um, I, I fancy myself a musician, and perhaps sometime, I mean, on my older podcast, there's plenty of uh, my uh, musical creations, and uh, I also fancy myself somewhat of an artist, and uh, as such, I have uh, to come up to discovered, and these are just really, really cool. Um, they're brush pens, uh, co Copic. C O P C yeah Copic I guess is the company, and it's like a felt tip pen with this really really long tip, and if you have a delicate enough touch, you can make these super fine lines, and of course, it just lay it down on the paper, and it's gonna make a big fat one. And I have always like done these strictly. Um, like rapidiograph like lines very the same thickness and uh, I've only in recent years learned to vary my line thickness I'm sort of a cartoonist with that does these really I, I have to say uh, the glyph like figures and shapes that I make are sort of unique uh, it, it, uh, my stuff is sort of my own signature in a way I mean I don't see very much like mine and other people have told me I don't need to sign my work because my work just looks like my work so um, using these brush pens is opening up a whole new world for me and uh, perhaps as the show art sometime I will uh, start using um, some examples uh, right now I'm just self-portraits and pictures taken by uh, my liminary friends on our vacation because uh, basically uh, as I because I also post these on YouTube I need an image there and I may as well just have a, a picture of me I mean I'm not gonna appear as I said I don't think me gesticulating and talking on camera is particularly interesting but uh, my, I, I appreciate this invention of the brush pen because I can't see myself learning to use a brush and like dipping it in the ink and getting every... 
please. And then cleaning the brushes. It's like when I had rapidiographs and didn't properly care for them. And uh, in a very short amount of time, I destroyed a perfectly good set of fine rapidiographs that someone gifted me once. So, yeah, that, if, appreciate it or not, I can be really um, hell on art supplies and equipment in general. Uh, I, I like stuff I can just use and maintenance is very low. That's why I use MP3s, not uh, records that you have to clean and the needle and just like that. And uh, yeah, the little clock on the uh, recorder is saying we have had a full appreciation here. So I'm just going to quickly give you the email address, which remains kpqr.torc at gmail.com. And um, once again, let us set the controls for the heart of the fun together. <laughs>